Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you very much for the kind words. And as you can actually tell, that's my old office in the background. I learned when we designed our new facility that my office should be as far away from the medicine ball wall as possible for, <laughs> for noise concerns, because this is something that, that we use a lot every day. Um, so why does medicine ball come around? Well, the first thing is specificity is awesome until it isn't, right? We know that there are certain things that we want to train with our athletes uh, to create adaptation. We want to be able to train hip shoulder separation in some capacity. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can throw you around and we certainly can't throw you around at a high intensity. Um, we know that we kind of have to tickle the kind of adaptation that gives us, you know, humoral retroversion in young throwers, but at the same time, we don't want to push it so far that we, we wind up with growth plate issues in the, the proximal humerus. So there's always a balance of how much you can push. Um, the other thing I think that's challenging is, is conventional strength conditioning approaches generally will create negative adaptations with respect to the fascial system and movement variability. So as an example, if you test an athlete's thoracic rotation, particularly if you have a very wide infrasternal angle athlete who carries a bunch of muscle mass and a lot of extensor tone, and you have them go deadlift 405 pounds and then you go back and you retest, their, their rotational capacity generally falls off. Um, so throwing more tone in the wrong places isn't necessarily ideal. And this is something that allows us to use the force that we've, we've built um, a little bit more functionally. So um, a way to train multiple planes, fascial systems is something that's getting more and more research um, now that we have better technology to actually assess how it works. And this piggybacks a lot on, on um, Joe's presentation on manual therapy from earlier. I think the last thing is there's a point on this, this force velocity curve that, that's very hard to train that we've overlooked for, for a while. And we'll talk about that in a second. But um, obviously, we know pitching has some pretty crazy demands. Um, certainly, the, the layback position um, has, a, has a ton of challenges for both the shoulder and the elbow. And ball release can be just as problematic for some athletes. Hitting, same idea. Um, you know, crazy rotation at the hip. Stride length is, you know, 85 centimeters or 380% of hip width. You have this big interaction between hip mobility and lumbar stability, the, the ability to transfer force from the lower half um, up ultimately to the hands into the back. We need to be able to train this. We can't just shut it down for, for five months out of the year when the season's not happening. And this is an avenue through which to do it. The problem tends to be is that most athletes fall um, with respect to program design somewhere in the wrong spot on this continuum. So if we look at how progress interacts with variability, if, if we have a very, very little variability, athletes just come in, they squat, they bench, they deadlift, and then they go out and they throw as much as they possibly can, we don't see great progress, right? Because they often get hurt. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, if we have, you know, far too little, or sorry, excuse me, far too much variability, they get exposures to so many different patterns that they never actually learn. So a big chunk of what we need to do with our athletes is give them enough familiarity with exercises to actually develop adaptation, but at the same time, expose them to this rich proprioceptive environment that allows them to handle the adjustability that comes with being a baseball player where, you know, you might have to turn around and go back on a fly ball. You might have to change directions in a rundown. All these different things that, you know, life and sports throw at you, you have to be able to adjust to. And we know that, you know, this piggybacks, you know, somewhat on my, my thoracic spine presentation from earlier, but effectively, if you look at this, this foot contact position, your left ASIS and right ASIS have already started to rotate towards the plate while the right and left shoulder joint center of rotation are still moving in the opposite direction. So this is your hip shoulder separation at foot contact. We talked a little bit on the panel about don't generate velocity until front foot strike. This is when it happens. Whereas everything tends to be more squared up at max extra rotation and ball release. We need to train this um, in what we do with our athletes. Um, and certainly medicine ball exercise are a way to do it. This is right at foot plant. The, again, the torso is still moving counterclockwise, um, excuse me, clockwise while the, the pelvis is moving counterclockwise. When we look at how sprinters have historically been developed, we know that they would sprint and do plyos over at the absolute speed end of the spectrum. And then they would squat, they would deadlift, they would lift heavy at this end of the spectrum to improve their force capacity. But they would also spend a lot of time working in this kind of middle of the road, speed strength, more jump squats at 30% of one rep max or Olympic lifts at a higher percentage, but still moving the bar really fast. When you get a well-developed athlete, they can benefit from a little bit of all of these. Conversely, if you get a really untrained athlete when they're young, you might bring them all the way over to the end of the spectrum because at age 14, 15, all they've ever really done is, is sprinted at body weight and throw a five ounce baseball. When we actually apply this to what we can do with, with pitchers and with hitters, 
we realized that they obviously will naturally have spent a lot of time at the absolute speed end of the contingent. We can introduce some strength training. Some athletes may be candidates for weighting balls, depending on where they're at, their you know, point in their develop is. And then med balls, most like a Proteus or a Versa pulley, all these things can kind of fill in this strength speed gap for some of these athletes who may already be strong and need to shift a lot more of their training left on the continuum. Then the research is very much in support of this. I referred earlier to, to Graham Lehman in 2013, who showed that uh, throwing velocity was correlated with a unilateral jump in the frontal plane, but linear power measures were not correlated to rotational velocity. And this is why we see so many you know, athletes who have underwhelming vertical jumps, but can throw 95. It actually happens more often than you could possibly believe. Um, we also know that lumbopelvic control predicted whip and in innings pitch in the season that followed in athletes. Um, and these are things that we can easily train with some of our medicine ball exercises. Um, Szymanski at, at Louisiana Tech has done a lot of research in baseball strength and conditioning. He found that a medicine ball program improved the results of a lifting and hitting program on measures of rotational strength and power more than just lifting and hitting. So there's some kind of synergistic initiative that comes from throwing med balls on top of just playing baseball and strength training. Um, how do we attack this? Early in the off season, it's very recovery oriented. We're not doing a lot of aggressive elbow extension. We use med balls to, to train rotation in the right places, learning to move through the thoracic spine, learning to brace into the front hip, um, you know, working on single leg balance. We'll, we'll train it four days a week and I wouldn't even call it power training. It's very regenerative in nature and maybe part of a, a low key circuit to build an aerobic base. Thereafter, we'll ramp it up and we'll get after it quite a bit. It might be one rotational, one overhead exercise per session for three to four sets. Usually what we'll do is we'll pair it with some kind of filler exercise where we'll do a medicine ball throw and then we'll work on some kind of mobility. So something that kind of effectively shortens the learning loop on taking some of those new movement capacities and integrating it with our rotational power stuff. And this serves as a great bridge from, from doing nothing to, to playing baseball. We're hitting and throwing are really going to ramp up often around, you know, late November, early December for a typical minor leaguer. Um, late off season, January rolls around, guys start to get off the mound more often. Hitters are in many cases seeing more velocity on the machine. So we may taper off on how much shot put stuff we're doing and use more rotational scoop tosses. The volume just comes down because you're, you're, there's a trade-off between how much you can train rotation in the gym and how much you can train it out on the field. And then once we get in season, the volume is low. I'll use it on our, our seven day rotation guys in college, sometimes with our five day rotation athletes, just as a way to maintain some symmetry. Um, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, designated hitters who hit from the right side. They take 500 swings a day from one side, go in and do a couple sets of 10 left only rotational med ball throws. Try to find some kind of symmetry in, in what you're working on. So these are some of the exercises we really like to use. Half kneeling anti-rotation shot put, great exercise for learning to brace into the front hip, get good scapular movement around the rib cage, and really learn to kind of like find that ball release position from the right paths. Split stance anti-rotation scoop toss, we get up, we raise the center of mass away from the base of support. And as they get more comfortable with this, we'll creep them away from the wall just a little bit more so that they can, again, generate a little bit of power, but find it through that thoracic spine while working over a, a braced front hip. We can start to train balance too. anti-rotation, receive and release. You'll see athletes really struggle with this early in the off season. And then we can get more unpredictable with it. I'll throw change-ups, cutters. I'll throw high, I'll throw low. We'll make them work at it just a little bit more. And then we'll start to go to some of our actual competencies, right? Shot put variations. We're talking about front hip pullback, um, learning not to drift outside that back foot. So we talk a lot about shin angle. You're also getting some hip loading in that sagittal plane to kind of delay rotation just a little bit. And then obviously a scoop toss, something that tends, generally tends to be a little bit more elbow and shoulder friendly. Again, notice how he works into his front hip. We use the analogy of riding a bike into a curb. Um, you have to brace into that front hip in order to effectively create that slingshot forward. Figure eight shot put a rhythm drill we're used for athletes who may need a little bit of help with getting the hips going. So the hand movement actually would drive some hip movement in that frontal plane. Step back scoop toss showing a little bit more pretension and get back into that hip. And you watch for, do they drift? Um, we talk a lot about maintaining the head behind the belly button as long as they can. Way to get more athletic Two hop to rotational scoop toss. Good one for hitters as they start to appreciate how to hold their back hip during their positive move and use the ground a little more effectively. 
step behind shot, but a little more of an aggressive one. Athletes really love to get after this one. And you can see guys doing this before they start throwing. Um, you know, obviously in, in rehab progression, you got to be careful. You wouldn't roll this out in three months on a Tommy John guy, but you'll find that athletes later on can really benefit from us. And we found it's been really, really helpful alongside some of the two-handed plyo progressions and even the early stage throwing stuff if we're talking about, um, you know, scoop tosses. We'll do exercises like double play where it's reactive. Um, I tend to be very careful with these in season because every once in a while, you'll get a guy who catches it on his thumb just a little bit wrong. Um, so in that case, you might be better off with a scoop toss variation as opposed to a shot put. You can make it a little bit more position specific with catcher versions. Um, so we'll do open loop drills where we may clap and an athlete has to retrieve the ball before they go into their rotational progression. All good things where you integrate some hip mobility. Receive and release scoop toss. One of my favorite ones. We actually have a tennis player that we're using a lot of this with. Um, he kind of struggles when he gets jammed on his backhand side. So we're using a 10 pound med ball. We're feeding this hard into that side and making him control it a little bit better. So adding eccentric emphasis can be helpful. And then obviously overhead progressions, anti-extension work. Don't let the ribs flare up as your arms are overhead. You can make this much more unpredictable. You can use varying weights. Kneeling overhead catch to stomp, another exercise for resisting extension. The med ball shouldn't pull your hands behind your head. So again, you're getting some eccentric control through lats, long head of the triceps. Recoil roll over stomp, element of thoracic rotation with it. Again, he, he probably cuts his hip rotation a little bit shorter. I usually like to see a little bit more athleticism in the lower half here. Split stance, double clutch. So you get a little bit of that same eccentric emphasis in the overhead position, but you also have to brace into that front leg. So this is something you'll see our athletes hitting really hard three days a week at this time of year. Even young guys, this is the most athletic 13 year old med ball I ever saw. So I had to videotape it. He's a younger brother and his older brothers have been training for a while. So he's had the cheat sheet for a while. Um, split stance, recoil over stomp, one of my favorite ones, just because you get a little bit of a rotational emphasis, really, really good for pitchers learning to brace into that front hip and get that front hip pullback that we like to see that takes triplanar motion and makes it more linear late in the delivery. Figure eight roll over stomps, another kind of a rhythm drill. Some athletes like to get wider with their stance here. Some like to be a little bit shorter. So you do see a little bit of, uh, you know, individual preferences that, you know, you can almost pick out some of their deliveries in the way they throw med balls. And then a crow hop, this one's a lot of fun to do. You'll see athletes that, that can't crow hop into their non-dominant side. So it's always entertaining to see a right-handed pitcher crow hop with the right leg forward. And just, you know, as I wrap it up, this is something that for me differentiates kind of the, the big leaguers from the boys. Um, when you watch really good athletes do med balls, you realize there's so much good stuff happening. Front leg bracing, scapular movement around the rib cage, solid finish position. This is Steve Ciszek. Steve's got close to 10 years in the big leagues. Um, and, and is a really, really effective med ball guy. And you actually see him do it from the opposite tie, side too, which is even just as impressive. So I look a lot at how well do athletes throw on their non-dominant side? Are they able to generate the same kind of power, at least comparable to it? Or does it look really, really uncoordinated? Certainly the multi-sport athletes from younger years seem to do it really well um, as compared to the guys that were baseball only. So definitely good stuff and stuff that we integrate a ton in, in, in what we do on a daily basis at the facility.